You may have got my email. I have changed my office hours this Thursday because we're having a TA meeting. My office hours are now 3 to 4. You do have a final coming up. I expect to see you in my, uh, in my office at some point. So let's pick up from where we left off. But first, we have to set the stage a little bit so we remember the sort of anguished sturm und drang of the Victorian crisis of faith, where we had scientists and intellectuals wondering where their faith was to come from. Remember, we had that quote from Frederick Myers, and he asked his mentor, Henry Sidgwick, when all else has failed, when science and theory and philosophy and theology and tradition, when all of that points to darkness, to utter nothingness, where can we go from here to find God? And what he's telling us in that passage is that there's been a paradigm shift in the 19th century, and that the rhetoric of faith, while still very pervasive, it's still very important amongst Victorians to think of themselves as religious people, as people of faith, in their heart of hearts, some people, particularly intellectuals, were wondering, is faith enough? I mean, what has faith accomplished? If you look at proof now, if you look at this rhetoric of proof, that great march of progress, remember that Comte talked about the positive age, the age of all of this industrial might and achievement and imperial expansion and industrial revolution, that is the positive age. That is an age built on fact, built on science, built on proof. And that age is rapidly expanding everywhere around us. It is erecting great steel cathedrals to modernity. Giant bridges, uh, uh, transatlantic cable wires, and, uh, and train tracks. I mean, modernity is going at a fleet pace. It is accomplishing so much powered by this rhetoric of truth. And what is religion doing? Religion seems like it's stalled. They're just talking about the same old, same old theological passages from the Bible. Faith is looking so vulnerable right now. And even, remember, you, uh, I don't know if all of you have done the reading for this week, but there's a really interesting passage in Freud, in Civilization and Discontent. And Freud comes right out and says it. And he says, those of you who think that science and religion can share the field are wrong. He understands, he gets it at a core level that these are two profoundly antithetical systems of thought. Remember, the mid-Victorian solution to the crisis of uh, faith and reason was going to be, let's let the religious people do their religion thing. And in fact, we'll join them on Sunday. And let's let the science people do their science thing. And let's try to accommodate faith and reason, science and religion, within an ever-expanding framework that allows them to be separate spheres of inquiry, but yet part of a uniform culture. And that's kind of the solution we have today, this idea that faith and reason, science and religion are separate spheres. But Freud was on to something. Freud understood that there's something in the ambitions of science that give it a Weltanschauung, that give it a worldview with a set of moral implications, a set of assumptions and objectives that are going to describe what the ultimate goal is about being human. And if religion also wants to define those ultimate issues, then aren't they going to come into conflict? Well, Freud, because he so embraced this idea of, a scientific, uh, pr of scientific progress, really wants to come and see an age where science does push religion out of the way. He talks about the most dangerous and detrimental regressive force is religion. So he hopes to clear the 20th century of it and erect this new catechism of reason. But when we're looking at people in the 19th century, people like uh, Frederick Myers, who in the 1870s and 1880s are looking forward, and they see Freud's conclusion of a world dominated by science, of religion chased off, they think, no, that is not the world I want, 
And yet that is the world we are going to be left with because science is advancing at such a rapid pace. If we don't employ science to somehow prove the existence of God, God in the words of Nietzsche, will be dead. So, although he didn't put it uh, quite that way, he said he was dead already. So, uh, it's all very, very bleak. So now, we should get, there's something big going on when we have scientists and intellectuals running to seances to try to grab hold of a ghost and say, I can prove scientifically that spirits exist. We should see that this rhetoric of proof is now trying to invade the traditional enclave of faith, that we've got the hint of a new kind of synthesis. A synthesis where science, within the tradition, the British tradition of the middle way, is going to try to find a new kind of accommodation, where science and religion are going to continue to work hand in hand, except now religion is going to become one of the projects of science. God himself is going to become an object of scientific inquiry. And it's important, and what we're going to talk about today is this project of synthesis. Because we all forget that this happened. In the 20th, 21st century, we think reason and faith, science, religion, parted ways in the 19th century. And everybody saw that this was the clear way the future had to go. But what's so interesting is how much struggle, how much resistance, how much of our cultural energy as modern people has gone in to try to find a reconciliation between science and religion. The most important, the most important scientists of the day in the 19th century were somehow involved in this project. That brings us back now to these investigations sponsored by William Crookes and how important they were to people of reason who desperately wanted to have faith. One of the first investigations he did, and we, you already had a paper on this and got some background, so I'm going to be really brief and just emphasize the important stuff. We talked about Dee Dee Holm, the guy that was witnessed by all the elites uh, floating out one window, floating through the air, and entering in through another window and therefore injecting into a very, very wide dis public discussion that this stuff must be real. Scientists think it's real. These crazy rich people think it's real. And there's all these people attesting to this phenomenon. That was the environment in which William Crookes, discoverer of thallium, um, winner of, member of the Royal Society, and he's a winner of the Order of Merit, he is going to conduct an investigation. It's going to be a different investigation than anything we've seen before. It's not going to be some scientist going into a dark room where there's a medium surrounded by spiritualists. He's going to take the medium and put him in a laboratory, tie him up to all sorts of uh, equipment to see if he can measure whatever this vital, mysterious, mental, psychic force is that enables Dee Dee Home to levitate, that enables Dee Dee Home to read your mind, to look into the future. One of the, uh, these are just pictures from the actual scientific study that Crookes published in the Quarterly Scientific Journal. And if you see that there, he is, Dee Dee Holm is playing um, an accordion with one hand. Well, obviously, to play an accordion, you need mechanical pressure on both sides. You need something pushing both sides. You literally can't play it with one hand. But there he is, playing the accordion with one hand, that means the other side of the accordion must somehow be played or pushed by his mind. That his mind is actually interacting with matter and generating some kind of mechanical impact. How is that possible? In a Cartesian dualistic world, mind and matter are separate. Spirit and the physical are two totally different orders of existence. And yet, here we have this strange interpenetration, this suggestion that Mind and matter do interact. Here's another one of his tests. He has this board, and it's actually being suspended on something that can, this instrument that is going to weigh the foot-pound pressure of the board. Dee Dee Home just puts his little fingertips, applying no pressure, just mental energy, onto the edge of the board. And suddenly, the board either gets really, really heavier, or the board gets a lot, lot lighter. 
what's happening is psychic force entering into the board and charging it with more atomic mass, more weight? Is psychic energy pulling the mass somehow out of the board? This is a weird interaction of mind and matter. And remember what we've been talking about, this great industrial metaphor for modern science, um, the picture of the cosmos in 19th century Victorian scientific naturalism. It is this big belching machine where electrical energy can come out of chemical energy. Chemical energy can create mechanical energy. Mechanical energy can create heat energy, can then um, dispel into radiant energy. And there's all of this exchange, this transformation of energy. But it's an energy system, no new energy. Energy never enters into the system. And energy never dies. It's just transformed. Think of it as a totally locked down, sealed system. And all of that energy is quantifiable. It's been proven over and over again by Helmholtz and everyone else, even this magical animistic stuff that makes our bodies move. All of that is the same kind of physical energy, biochemical physical energy. It's all the same part of the same physical system. If there was mental energy, if there were ghosts coming in and out of the system, you should be able to measure it. Therefore, it can't happen. There's no room in this world for extra kinds of energy. This must be a fraud. And yet, you have the evidence. Crookes actually comes out and he publishes in the quarterly scientific journal, the results from this study. And he says, look, I know it's not possible. I know if I were being purely reasonable, I would not dare say this, these things. But in fact, since we have the evidence now before us, reason actually demands that I publish this account and proclaim for everybody to know that it is now, he writes, it is now an undisputed fact that from our bodies, um, some persons have a spe special nerve organization. They produce a force that operates and out of their minds and somehow connects with matter. So he's publishing this in a scientific paper. He's putting it in the Quarterly Journal of Science. It's picked up by a lot of different um, mainstream magazines, but it enrages the Royal Society because they don't want to see their decision, their commitment, uh, the leaders of the Royal Society have set a tone that science and religion are separate enterprises. And now you have crooks who's trying to sneak religion in the back door, in fact, through the back laboratory door. So he gets a lot of negative feedback. And yet, look, he's proved it. He can show you the graph of the force curve coming out of Dee Dee Holmes' fingertips. What more do you need? And so. He goes on to conduct a second experiment. And this set of experiments says, since we know that psychic force exists, we now have a right to venture an hypothesis about psychic for what psychic force is. And the most common hypothesis, of course, is the idea that somehow this psychic force is related to some kind of spiritual or subjective energy, that thing that if we were being religious and not scientific, we might call the soul. You already read this, but just to put it out there again, come on. He gets these pictures taken with a full-fledged ghost. That is not the medium. The medium, Katie uh, uh, Florence Cook, ran into her cabinet. The, per the thing that came out of the cabinet when the lights were darkened and the ghost appeared was actually a ghost. But this was an interesting kind of ghost. She's a fully materialized, full-blown physical ghost. She is a ghost, in fact, that has entered into this closed system we were talking about in thermodynamics where nothing can get in and nothing can get out. She's entered into matter itself and been able to incorporate herself, so much so that she even has a pulse. Now, when these pictures got out, um, caused a huge scandal. And William Crookes, for complex reasons I explained in that paper, had to back away from this idea. He'd overreached. Ghosts having pulses, 
ghost perambulating around a seance room arm in arm with a scientist? No, too much, gone too far, even though these Victorians were so hungry for that proof, he had abridged the boundaries, bridged the boundaries of proper science. It was obvious that this was not empirical enough. Now, William Crookes dumps his spiritual activity, but he goes and pursues a new kind of theoretical science that is going to create a context of plausibility that, hey, you know what? Maybe ghosts can materialize around seance tables. Maybe there's an actual science to explain this. I'm going to talk about two physicists, William Crookes and Oliver Lodge, who gave two important physical concepts that allowed Victorians to actually scientifically reason using core scientific principles that were embraced by the Royal Society and indeed have contributed to our own march of progress. And yet, um, these scientists created a language that could also be used to describe spiritual realities. So just going to show you the, these cool pictures to give you a sense of this bedazzling, bizarre world of Victorian science. So in 18, uh, eight, uh, 18 I think, 77 through 79, he starts working with his crooks too. And you have to imagine showing this to a group of Victorians. So he takes his crook tubes and he unveils it at the um, British Association for the Advancement of Science in Sheffield. And what do people see? A tube glowing with eerie green phosphorescent light. They'd never seen anything like it. He then introduced other forms of gas and other forms of matter. And then the tube would glow orange and green. And there'd be these great ribbons of blackness followed by swirling ribbons of color. And you could hold a magnet next to the tube. And then this matter would then start to bend towards the magnet. It was like he was watching matter behave like light. And then watching light revert back to matter. I thought energy and matter were separate. I thought this was a strictly dualistic world. He is showing in this Crookes tube a new kind of reality where energy and matter may be one and the same impulse. So I'm just going to read you um, some of his quotes about this, because it is actually really interesting. Uh, here he has it. We've seen some of the properties of radiant matter. It's as material as this table. But it also assumes some of the characteristics of radiant energy. And it's not supposed to do that. Energy and matter are not supposed to share characteristics. Have we touched a borderland where matter and force seem to merge into one into each other? That the shadowy realm between the known and the unknown, which for me has always had a peculiar temptation, are we up against that boundary? So what has he done? He's brought science, and a science he can show to the entire British Association for the advancement of science at their annual meeting. He's brought them right up to the gateway, had them poke them nose, their noses across the threshold. And what is that threshold? It is perhaps the threshold to the other world. He doesn't come right out and say it, but that's what he's saying. Now, um, just to let you know what's actually happening there, which isn't really crossing the threshold into a spiritual reality. He, he had, this is a crook's tube. So what he does is he takes a glass tube. You can't really see it, but that is actually a big glass tube. And if I, uh, didn't, OK. That's a big glass tube. He sucks out all, most of the air. You can't create a total vacuum, but you can suck out most of the air. And then he introduces an electrical current into the tube. So what he's doing is he's electrifying rarefied gas. Now, modern scientists will know and say, oh, that's nice. You're creating plasma gas. They didn't know that back then. And what happens, the, the uh, electrons that are introduced, the electricity flows. It's introduced from the negative end, and it flows out a positive end. And what ends up happening here, you see this big glowing green thing. Like, how does that happen? Well, it's an evacuated vessel. You've got electrons charging into it. And because it's so rarefied, they're not bumping into each other. They're not stopping each other. They're just 
racing, racing towards the other end of the glass where the positive charge is. And as they hit the back of the glass, they excite it, and what ends up happening is all these electrons start emitting light, and the electrons being knocked off the glass start emitting light, and it glows. And same thing is happening in, in, in another respect to the different kinds of gas he introduces. When you electrify the gas, it gets ionized, and suddenly there's all of these free electrons floating about, and then they start crashing into each other, and then they start giving off this strange, eerie light. He didn't know, as we know today, that the electron is part of the atom. That, in fact, electricity is a property of matter. He discovered it right here. He discovered electricity, that matter has this profoundly electrical quality, but he didn't know what an electron was. He wasn't there yet, so he wasn't able to fully interpret what was going on. As far as he was concerned, you had matter having a secret nature. You can look at matter as a solid. You know it can advance to a liquid, and you know it can advance to a gas, and it all looks physical, right? But what if it has this higher state of evolution? Note the key word evolution, this whole idea of um, framing reality within this evolutionary context is key to understanding the Victorian Weltanschauung, the Victorian frame of mind. So right beyond that, that state of gas, there's another higher, more mysterious state of reality that is the fourth state of matter in which Energy and physics interpenetrate. And so this completely has a way of shaking up the whole industrial notion um, of the nature of energy. And it provides a kind of formulation for saying, hold on, maybe there's kinds of energy we don't understand. Maybe matter and energy aren't so separate. Maybe there is a role for minds to penetrate matter. We just don't know this radiant energy may be akin to the kind of energy that uh, D.D. Holm is able to insert within a board and break up its matter and pull out its weight. We don't know. So here's the other big concept. This is just so you don't think the Victorians are so crazy, but also so you understand how serious this alternative paradigm which is going to synthesize religious inquiry into a scientific narrative is. You've got the top minds working on it. The new concept of matter in the Victorian age, in this age where you have things like electromagnetic waves, well, according to Victorians, electromagnetic waves are just that, they're waves. Waves don't travel in a void, right? You need water in order to create a wave. So how do you have electromagnetic waves if they're not waving through something? And so because you can no longer have this sort of reductive, simplistic, mechanistic worldview of atoms in a void, you know, that clockwork universe of the 18th century, you got this new sophisticated model. It required a new idea. And this is an idea that everyone embraced pretty much. It's part, it's part of the framework of Victorian scientific naturalism. I'm not saying everybody did, but it was really the dominant thesis. Everywhere around us is this invisible plenum called ether, kind of ghostly, really. And matter is really rotations in the ether. So you know if you took a bucket and it was filled with water and you went like this, that the kinetic motion um, would actually structure the water and it would look like a solid? How if you have enough energy in a fountain, it goes up and it creates like a column of water, the structure? So the idea is still that there's some prime mover who's put energy into the universe, but the energy is vortical motion. And these vortexes structure atoms. So if you want to understand what atoms are, there are these vortexes in the ether. Now look how great that is in terms of ghostly possibilities. We know that there's energy that goes into ether and structures matter, but we also know that Dee Home just showed that mind can somehow enter into matter. Can mind then enter into the ether and structure different forms, like, say, ectoplasm? Right around this time, they also start theorizing about this idea of ectoplasm. In the 1860s and 1870s, when we had these um, investigations of spiritualists and we had this 
big, full-blown spirit of Katie King, the pirate princess, what was she made of? Ether, ectoplasm. We had those uh, mediums start to like vomit out this weird, gooey, gossamer substance that it would shoot out their wrists and they would make sp other spirits and other forms and phantom limbs. It was getting really, really weird in the 1870s. And in the 1880s, somebody actually, a scientist, an important guy, Charles Roche, comes out and names this thing ectoplasm. And I think Oliver Lodge talks about it in uh, the article I gave you last week. Ectoplasm is conceptually consistent with the notion of ether. The idea of ether make, is a, just a very friendly notion that can sponsor this idea that, the, that matter can take on many different forms. It can be, if it's just structures of motion in the ether, then it can be manipulated by other forms of energy that restructure those motions in the ether. So it's going like gangbusters. Science is trying to work out this paradigm. But that's these synthetic scientists, the Oliver Lodges, the Frederick Myers, the William Crookses. Mainstream science, even though, when I say mainstream science, orthodox science will associate with the Royal Society and the British Association. That's the stuff they're allowed to say. The stuff they say in private to their friends, the kind of speculation they're having in private correspondence, you would be shocked, simply shocked, to know how many mainstream scientists were actually open to these ideas. Even if they're not publishing it in the Royal Society proceedings, everybody's curious, everybody's desperate to know. It's only the really hardcore materialists that are trying to shut this conversation down. Now, why is there all of this need? Well, look at, we just talked about this sort of magical, ghostly world that can be teased out of the ether and that can be teased out of radiant matter. Look at some of the frightening implications that can be teased out of Darwinism, that can be teased out of evolution. The dark side of Darwinism was very, very dark indeed. Cesare Lombroso was a criminologist who publishes um, this work in 1887, and it's about the sort of the, the criminal skulls of the skulls of Italian criminals. And he's making this very kind of depressing argument. You know how, in a traditional religious sense, free will is so important, moral choice, moral judgment is so important? Well, notions of free will have kind of been called into question by biological determinism because we know so much of what we are, these physical globules of human flesh, so much of what we are seems to have been put into the nature, into the hands of nature that has sort of worked blindly and we have just reacted to her sort of blind stimulus. And so when you tease out the implications of this, you should understand that even choices to become a criminal or choices to be good might not actually be your choices. They might be hereditary factors. And then you add to that this idea of descent from apes. So things like apes, we know that we are evolved out of much more pr primitive forms. When we look at criminals, perhaps we can see in them evolutionary throwbacks, atavistic throwbacks to a former time. So he publishes this work, and he takes measurements of all of these criminals, who I'm sure were just given pauper graves and then you know, dug up and having their skulls measured without being consulted on the matter, very nice. And he comes up with this sort of hilarious portraiture of a cliche of ape-like looks. You might be a criminal if you have extra long arms. You're insensitive to pain. You have a big jaw, a retreating forehead, one of those sloping ape-like foreheads, beady eyes, big lips, high cheekbones. He just goes on basically to conflate ape-like whatever features and um, superimpose them, a lot of times through trick photography, by the way, onto um, this, these human criminals. But what is he really doing? He's taking morality and ethics and human evolution uh, of moral pro Okay. All right. And moral progress, and he's inserting it into this 
horrible, blind, biologically determined matrix. It's a bummer. Even worse, if you don't have this sort of morality that you've accepted evolution, the bright side of evolution, that it's progressive. It's kind of nasty because survival of the fittest, but you know, who am I to judge God? And if that's the way God wants to work through nature, these are his laws, then there is something positive about it because we know we're aspiring to something good. But at the same time, what is good? Is it being taller, smarter, stronger, fitter? So good seems now to very keenly have a sort of biological attribute, whether it's biological intelligence or your biological physique, I thought good meant being spiritually good. But this is a kind of, of good that undeniably has this bizarrely um, reductive and even cruel materialistic component, even though it's couched in this socially progressive language. The first eugenicists were liberals. They turned into Nazis 40 years later, but you know, the first eugenicists were like, how can we make things better for society? And their findings were, well, since some of us are really not holding up our end in terms of you know, heredity, and we're kind of holding the rest of us back, maybe we should stop giving so much charity to the poor. You know they're unfit. Do we really want to give them enough calories that they can successfully reproduce? So you see, this is sort of, this is social, social eugenics, social Darwinism, this idea that the unfit are amongst us. They are very often the poor, and if you really want to make society more progressive, because that's the key term uh, for Victorians, you've got to do it by supporting the fit at the expense of the unfit. So do you see that if you're like a tender-hearted Victorian, raised in the 40s with this evangelical understanding that you know, God is pure love, God demands moral sacrifice from you, God, um, that, that it's not about these material triumphs, that the end game is all about your spiritual salvation, suddenly that message of spiritual salvation has become all tied up in the material here and now in very ugly ways. So this is very problematic. I mean, this is why Victorians are in crisis, because they're being bombarded by this kind of science. Darwin didn't mean for it. I mean, this was not his intention. But this is you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the line where you start to extrapolate political, social Darwinism, psychiatric Darwinism. You get all of these um, new kinds of discourses that are extrapolated from progressive evolution. And they're very competitive and very negative. And the other thing is, the, the idea of what the unconscious is is still very, very much up for grabs. It's been kicking around since Mesmer. What is it? The materialistic interpretation of the unconscious is that, you know what, if you look at the evolution of your brain, most of your brain is going to be sort of recidivistic, right? A lot of it is going to be these autonomic functions that you just inherited a nervous system and respiratory system and circulatory system you just and muscular uh, regulation. You inherited all of that from more primitive species, even going all the way back to insects. So quite frankly, that is just biological. A small piece of your brain, the latest installment, is this consciousness. But you know what? It's this much of your brain, all that intellect, that logic, that reason, that reflection. If you really look at who you are, most of your brain is dedicated to autonomic functions. Your machine. And therefore, when you sit around a table and you think the table is spinning, because you're not consciously aware that you're spinning it, therefore it must be spinning on its own. Oh, a ghost must be spinning it. The materialistic interpretation was that, no. It's just that your conscious is such a small part of your brain, your conscious isn't always aware of what the rest of your body is doing. The unconscious is doing it, the unconscious muscular cerebration. Muscles are just twitching and turning the table, you don't even know it. But look at this term, unconscious. Look at this use of the word unconscious. It literally means unconscious. There's nothing exciting, dynamic, dreamy, poetic going on down there. It's like a big factory, right? It's just where the gears keep your heart ticking and your blood running. And 
It has no heart, it has no soul, it has no mind. So in this medical and materialistic paradigm of the unconscious, science has threatened to take away the one thing that romantics were hoping to redeem the lost soul of the human race. They were hoping to redeem it, and now look, it's all going to the tubes. Now, big things start to happen in the 1870s and 1880s. Science embraces evidence, and, uh, proof, clinical trials. This is a portrait from the hospital, the French asylum called Salpetrier in France. It was the largest sanitarium in France, and it was, uh, it hospitalized basically women who were indigent, but also suffered from specific nervous disorders like epilepsy, hysteria, seizure. So it's very medical, very mainstream, very institutional, and yet it's literally housing hundreds of cases of people who are suffering from altered states of mind. So now we have potentially a chance to study the unconscious in a medical context, medical framework that's never existed before. This is Charcot, Jean-Martin Charcot. He has hundreds of students working for him, hundreds of patients, hundreds of, of students who come in and out of his school, and he gives demonstrations and one of the things he is demonstrating is that hypnotism is a real phenomenon. Now remember, importantly in France, hypnotism was driven underground because it was found to be fraudulent by the Franklin Commission. But you get someone of the stature and importance of Charcot who's got hundreds of students writing down clinical evidence saying, no, look at our papers, volumes and volumes of published material saying, we have all can attest to the fact that this stuff is real. In this sanitarium, women, when you hypnotized them, were lapsing into weird trance states. They were experiencing things like double consciousness, forgetting who they are, becoming another personality. Sometimes their bodies would become incredibly rigid and distorted, and they were able to do bizarre things with their bodies that they normally couldn't do. Sometimes in an unconscious state, they would find they had language skills that they didn't have in conscious states. Sometimes they would find that they created such a rapport with their hypnotizer, they could almost touch his thoughts, feel his feelings, whatever was going on in the unconscious. To try to understand it is just the basement furnace of your, of your mind is wrong. It's a weird, very eerie, very strange place that produces bizarre phenomena. Like one of the common things that was being discussed at this point was performing surgery on people without anesthesia. So this was well investigated by the time you get to the 1870s. And they were doing a lot of this, of course, in India where I guess their patients couldn't protest. Um, and they were just removing these giant goiters the size of oranges and not putting the, the subjects under anesthesia. What were they doing? Hypnotizing them. They literally, at this point, had the very sleepy, very sleepy watch routine down. And the idea is that you're shot, and I talked a little bit this about last week, but the idea is the brain is just a bunch of electrical currents. You shock the pattern, the electrical pattern, and you can force it into a smaller state, a reduced state of mind, and make it impervious to pain, make it impervious to consciousness, and therefore has the same effects as anesthesia. And this was actually attested to and clinically investigated. It was one of the, one of the things that Charcot and his students were considering about the strange nature of the unconscious. This is one of their patients. This is for very, uh, this is Louise Leteau. She was one of the famous patients of Charcot. She's experiencing stigmata. She's, she was a famous um, stigmatist who was able to make her palms bleed, her feet bleed, who was able to cry red blood tears. And because it's a sanitarium with lots of doctors and clinicians, they get pictures of it. This isn't happening in the woods somewhere, or in a church somewhere in the 1300s, right? This is now medical evidence being documented by medical men. It has to get 
the world's attention. Um, and they couldn't really explain how she's able to cry red blood. But they, this seemed to suggest that the mind can enter into manipulations of the body, again, echoes of the D.D. Home experiment with psychical research, the mind can enter into manipulations of the body and cause these physical changes. Even today, we're investigating this mind-body boundary in new ways. Um, and there's plenty of cases of, of stigmata out. You know, you can go Google it on the internet. Plenty of pictures. No one really knows why or how this happens. Of course, fraud is one of the huge uh, suggestions. But also, there's diseases that create hematoma under the skin that could possibly uh, give rise to this phenomena. But imagine what the Victorians are thinking. I mean, to them, this is proof positive that there is something powerful about consciousness, about the brain, something that can potentially manipulate the body itself. That's the opposite, right? Remember the machine view of the brain is this epiphenomenal view that first you get the body, and then the mind is kind of an evolutionary phenomenon. It's a result of, the, of having a body. This is clearly suggesting that mind is something distinct from body and that mind can actually manipulate body. And here is another one of their patients, and she was um, known for her. This, this is, these are the people that were the first to diagnose multiple personality. And in this uh, sanitarium at Salpetrier, and they noticed about her that you'd put her in a trance and her body would go into these bizarre physical contortions that literally would be impossible if she, if in a normal brain state, it would either be too uh, painful or too impossible to be able to do it. And that she also got these bizarre attitudes. Say in real life, she might be very dim and slow, but she got into this trance and suddenly she was laughing and engaging and behaving like some um, witty salonier, or she would start speaking other languages, or she would go into a beatific attitude as if she was having a, a kind of transcendent union with God. All of this was happening in the unconscious, but when she was conscious, she would just sort of stare at the wall. Of course, an alternative reading is that she was very clever and theatrical and thought it was really great to have three meals a day and all of this attention and was playing the hospital because a lot of these women were indigent you know, and they didn't have means of support, then they go to this hospital, and if they become the favorite trick pony of the doctors, um, you know, then they're going to get all of this attention and all of these privileges. So it's very funny that these, in some ways these scientists are undermined by their own arrogance. They never think anybody's going to be clever enough to get one over on them. But all of this then gets entered into the medical record. It must be true. All of these scientists have written about it and confirmed it and observed it. Now you've got something really, really good. You've got this new medical testimony that seems to trump those depressing Dar Darwinian interpretations of the brain as just another biological organ. And you've got the ether, and you've got radiant matter, and you've got the investigation of William, of uh, Didi Home by William Crookes. So, uh, Frederick Myers, who was so depressed in the 1870s that he felt he would never, he would never find a means of coming to faith, in 1882 established the Society for Psychical Research. The evidence at the time was so compelling. This seemed to be such an intriguing departure of inquiry that scientists who in the 1870s were starting to get really, really tired of the humiliation of spiritual investigations. It was just one fraud after another. And it looked like this whole project of science investigating spiritualism was going to die on the vine in the 1870s. But in the 1880s, they found a new language for discussing whatever this thing was that makes mind mysterious. This is what they call it. The Society for Scientific Research, uh, Society, for, Society for Psychical Research, and it is established by scientists and intellectuals to, quote, examine without prejudice or prepossession 
And in a scientific spirit, those faculties of man, real or supposed, which appear to be inexplicable on any generally recognized hypothesis. Notice what they're doing. They're saying, bad scientists make a hypothesis. Bad scientists say, oh, I know what it is. It's a spirit. Other bad scientists say, oh, I know what it is. It must be unconscious muscular cerebration. It's just your nervous system, or it's just a hallucination. Those are bad scientists. We're going to be good scientists. We're not going to advance a hypothesis until we've got some evidence we can reflect on. So all we're going to do is investigate those faculties of man. And you know what? They're saying they're real or imagined. They're not even going to come out and say, I think these faculties really exist. But let's face it, they're founding a society to investigate them, so I think they think they really exist. Um, and they're saying these faculties, we know if they exist, can't be explained by any generally recognized hypothesis. So you're going to have to change your scientific paradigm if we come up with evidence for this stuff being real. And who's, who's a member of this organization? You got a future prime minister. You've got, a, um, you've got bishops. You've got uh, elite physicists. You've got uh, the society is founded. Most of the people who found it are from Cambridge. Top, top, upper crust of the Victorian intelligentsia. And the first thing they do, their first order of business is to establish a literary committee. And what the literary committee does is they publish an, um, an advertisement that goes out to America and it goes all around Britain. And all they're asking is for people who have had noted some bizarre experience. If you've had an experience of thought reading or clairvoyance or a presentiment, you've known something was going to happen and then it turned out to happen, and afterwards you were able to confirm it, please write in and tell us about it. Now, what is so interesting is that they received thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of mail. So much it was just stacked up in the company office. So much information. And that as they went through it, they had a certain criteria that they tried to impose. Oh, you, if you think you actually saw an apparition of your brother before his ship went down, you have to have told somebody you saw the apparition of your brother. And then your ship, brother's ship actually has to have gone down. So it needs to be confirmed. They're also very snooty. They want to know who you are. Like, you know, if you're a curate or a curate's wife, that's good. You know, you should be a respectable, middle class sort of person. And lo and behold, this stuff had so saturated the Victorian mainstream that, you know, historians, philosophers, uh, you know, Betty Homemaker, all of these people were calling in with not just experiences, but corroborated experiences that they'd seen a ghost gotten a message from the beyond. And so they take all of, this, um, all of these anecdotes and they publish them in something called Phantasms of the Living. You can still get it off of um, probably on Amazon. Maybe not an original version, but I think it's also electronically on the internet. And imagine what this did to the Victorian world. Suddenly you had this anecdotal life of spirituality, and you know there's a huge anecdotal life that keeps the idea that there are ghosts and spirits very much alive. In fact, if I were to be impertinent and have a survey in this room who believes in ghosts, who's seen a ghost, I'm guessing half the hands. Anybody care to share? OK, but obviously there's still a certain stigma. Um, I know that I've got friends that tell me stuff, and it's intriguing. I had a friend whose mother passed away, and um, when her mother was alive, at 6 p.m., her mother always used to dim the lights for dinner. And for months after her mother died, she said, at 6 p.m., the lights would dim. She also had a, a boy over at the house. And when her mother was alive, she was not allowed to be in the house unchaperoned. She always had, if she, there was a boy over there, there better be somebody else there, too. And sure enough, she goes into the kitchen with the boy. The blender turns on. The coffee machine turns on. The stove turns on. Every appliance is going crazy and violent. And she ran out of the house, or at least I think the guy did. Um, <laughs> and so, but notice how there's this modern day conflation again with, those were all electrical appliances. Was it 
is the ghost the electrical energy? Is the ghost manipulating the electrical energy? I don't know, but we inherited this whole discourse from the Victorians. But also, what am I supposed to make of that? Am I supposed to think my friend is a liar? She's my friend, so obviously I think she's an honest and good person. So the world is just everybody knows somebody that they've heard this from, and it just becomes part of your almost empirical experience, right? If you didn't directly experience it, you can accept the testimony of a friend, kind of as anecdotal, but it's more than just anecdotal because you know the person, so it's more evidential. Now look at what they're doing. They're taking all of these stories from all the most respectable people, and they're publishing them in one place, and it's overwhelming. They're actually able to take what was once just stories about ghosts and turn it into a compelling scientific document. They are going gangbusters. They are going to make science use scientific protocols, scientific evidence, scientific style arguments to bring ghosts thundering back into the world. They also, but they would never say that, they also had a committee on mesmerism and thought, reach, uh, thought reading to establish, and we're going to go over some of these experiments because they're really cool, um, because it's one thing to say that you can read somebody else's mind, but is there a laboratory protocol you can set up? Now we're very familiar with this laboratory protocol with the Zener decks and the guessing the, um, the shape on the card. It's called parapsychology. These are the first people to do it. They set up a laboratory situation. They take two people and they um, try to, uh, at, you know, to observe mind reading under controlled circumstances. The other thing they do is they establish a committee on physical phenomenon. Who's in charge of the committee on physical phenomenon? Physicists. It's not like that show, The Ghostbusters, where they just have those guys jumping in a van and going to, you know, these are guys. This would be like as if you got Stephen Hawking to drive the van. All right, so this is the Committee on Physical Phenomena was staffed by reputable physicists. And as physicists, they, in, they investigate phenomena like levitation. That's a physical phenomenon. Uh, strange smells, strange sounds, uh, apparitions, all of that that seems to imply that there's some kind of physical anomaly going on. Um, and psychologists would be on the Committee on Mesmerism and Thought Reading and they would be the ones that are looking for mental anomalies. So this psychical energy was investigated both as a mental phenomenon and as a mental kind of energy that could actually alter the physical systems in which we lived. So here's one of my favorite investigations. It's just very, very uh, cool. Um, there were these two girls in a factory in Manchester, and they got this tremendous reputation for being able to do spooky things, constantly reading each other's minds, guessing what was in other people's pockets, guessing what people were thinking about, even uh, suggesting that they could communicate with ghosts. And the Psychical Research Society got a hold of this, and they said, this is a perfect uh, kind of experiment for us. So they took the girls, they brought them to a sort of a, a laboratory environment, they got a very respectable monitors to observe everything they were doing, one of whom was the great physicist Oliver Lodge. And these are notes from Oliver Lodge's investigation. And Oliver Lodge is a good physicist, says, look, I'm embarrassed to be here. And if I have to be here, I am going to impose strict scientific controls. He made the girls blindfold themselves. He put a big easel between them so they could. there's no way they could communicate through this um, while blocking them. He made sure somebody was watching them on either side of the easel for any attempts, any flicks of the finger, any attempts to communicate. And he would have, and he broke them up into um, a team. One was going to be the percipient, and one was going to be the projector. So the projector is the one that you show the card to. In this case, Lodge showed the, the girl, we'll call her Miss D. Um, well, I guess he's calling her Miss R. OK, so he shows Miss R picture of a teapot. And he says, Miss R, I want you to think of nothing but this teapot for five minutes and see if you can get this image of the teapot into Miss T's head. And this is what Miss T draws. However, what is so interesting is that Miss T says, oh, I'm not really sure what it is. I think it's a duck. 
Now clearly, Miss R did not tell Miss T, I'm actually drawing a teapot. So she didn't verbally communicate. But what seems to have happened is the image got into Miss T's head somehow. And she looked at it and she said, well, that kind of looks like a tail. And that kind of looks like a head. It looks like, I feel like I'm seeing a shiny, silvery duck. And then he gave Miss T another uh, picture. And he said, look at these two things. Here's a box. Here's an X. Think about it for five minutes. And sure enough, on the other side of the screen, we get Miss T writing, a, a, drawing a square and putting the X in it. Oliver Lodge, by the way, this study is done in the mid-1880s. Oliver Lodge in 1894 is the first to realize um, the mechanism you need for wireless telegraphy. They'd already had, tel um, they already had telegrams, but now they, but now they, uh, oh, sorry, 18, is, is there some, is it Norton? What is he doing? Does he want to go outside? Why not? Okay, take, you want to take him outside? Um, okay. Oh, no, you've got to go out with him. You just can't put him out there. Okay. <laughs> Where was I? Um, oh, yeah, wireless. Okay, so this is the guy, not Marconi that actually discovered that you can send electromagnetic waves via a, um, a telegraph. In Morse code, you can pull those electrical impulses out of the air, decode them, and read them. Sounds a lot like the kind of thing you do when you transmit a message from mind to mind. So he takes this idea that he's very much inspired by this investigation into the girl's telepathic capacities in the 1880s, and he Trans, uh, transforms it, uses it as the basis for one of the great scientific discoveries of the 1890s. But look at the way he's talking about the brain after watching these girls. He says, the brain is the organ of consciousness. I mean, it is the material basis on which uh, brains are, in, in which thought is generated. But we shouldn't reduce the consciousness to the brain itself. That's clearly not what's happening. The brain consciousness is not just in the brain, it's also surrounding the brain. Just like a charge can be in the wire, but also surrounding the wire, the way uh, matter is, ha, seems to have an electrical nature, but it also has a field nature, there's something about the brain that can be analogized by field theory. And look what happens. The girl thinks of the silver teapot. And obviously, that idea is moving through space, but it's getting fainter and fainter and fainter. And by the time it arrives in the other girl's brain, acting like a coherer, right, acting like the receiving end of a telegram, um, she's able only to pick out the image slightly distorted. She doesn't see the teapot. She sees a silvery duck. She doesn't see a square and a cross. She sees a square with a cross in it. But here we have Oliver Lodge giving a field interpretation of the brain, just as his field interpretation of electricity would allow him to develop the wireless um, telegraph. And here's uh, Oliver Lodge doing this really cool, he built this machine, and he's trying to whirl it and whirl it and whirl it to cause disturbances in the ether and prove that you can sort of, he was trying to kind of grab the ether and spin it ever, ever faster. And, um, this is just an example of how he's actually using laboratory protocols to investigate this hidden dimension of the world. What was the ether? Nobody'd seen it. Now, Frederick Myers, who you have this reading this week, so I can just go through this pretty quickly. Frederick Myers is looking at all of this new evidence, the evidence that the girls are reading each other's minds. He's pouring over all this data from Saul Petrier, and he's understanding that women are able to manifest stigmata, women are able to speak foreign languages. He looks at the case of Louis V, uh, Louis v who was one of the patients at Saul Petrier, and that was the um, reading that you were assigned. And he says, look, there's something very bizarre, very phenomenal, and very interesting that is going on here. It is something 
that clearly implies when you close, when, when you are in an altered state of consciousness, you are not in an unconscious state. This is not a mechanical aspect of mind because people are thinking and feeling and doing extraordinary things. Now, on the one level, maybe you slip into one of the atavistic apparatuses. So you go into a trance state and you slip into a portion of your brain that might be really, really um, a residual carryover part of your more primitive structures of your mind. What is he doing? He's acknowledging biological evolution. He's saying, yeah, your brain evolved out of more primitive life forms. Your brain still bears the mark of this more primitive kind of architecture. And therefore, when someone goes into a trance and they start behaving violently and they want to shoot their mothers, you cannot use that to judge the entire unconscious. You should just understand the mind has slipped, has become located in a more primitive part of the mind. But look what also happens. If you get a gifted medium and she goes into a trance, suddenly she can read your mind. Suddenly she can communicate with ghosts. Suddenly she can read the future, participate in a past that wasn't hers. How does she do that? This is all the apparatus of the unconscious. And it shows that parts of our mind might be very primitive, but also the unconscious is the way that we can access the leading evolutionary edge. I mean, he's speculating that maybe 100 years from now, we'll all be able to read each other's minds, that there's something about the nature of consciousness. As it advances through more primitive life forms, it becomes more evolved. The more evolved it becomes, we know one of its evolutionary capacities just might be the ability to interfere, to reach into matter and alter the structures of matter. We may in fact be on the cusp, not of being victims of biological determinism and, and um, evolved reacting to the blind stimulus of nature. We might be on the cusp if we can master this unconscious, if we can get, turn this handle he's talking about, the mechanism of our being, we might be able to participate in our own evolution. Conscious may be advancing peri pursue with matter. And soon, consciousness may actually come to dominate matter. Now, that is extremely, that's in your reading, so you can look at that. Um, here is a little example from his journal to give you a sense of what I'm saying. He's looking at here fetal development. And you can see he's actually suggesting, remember, they don't have DNA at this point. I mean, how are they supposed to understand how a, a fetus develops, how that, that mysterious process unfolds? Because it does require intelligence and information. For a fetus to, to develop requires intelligence and information. However, that information is encoded genetically. If they don't know about genes, where are you going to get the information from? Consciousness. You see? This all makes perfect sense in the 1890s. So he's saying, we have proof of this just the way fetuses seem to be able to organize matter as they develop. And it's all conflated with telepathy, with telekinesis, with the penetration of mind and matter. So after 10 years of study, the Psychical Research Society, well, they never make a formal declaration, but he's a major, major thinker. And he says, he, he, he publishes a work that confirms the reality of all these things. Subliminal messages, you bet. Genius as a function of the unconscious, absolutely. Hypernesiac dreams, which means in a dream, you're able to remember stuff you could never remember if you weren't in this altered state of consciousness. Um, the mechanisms of hysteria, which we've already talked about, which are heightened sensation, receptiveness to other people's thoughts, the ability to manifest um, sub-personalities with different skill sets, um, blah, blah, blah. The most cool ones, of course, were the relation of supernormal phenomena to time, retrocognition, the relationship of supernormal phenomena to time, precognition. I mean, it's one thing to understand the mind body relationship in such a way that you can make your eyes bleed. But it's another thing. How do you explain causality if you can foresee the future? 
young, it should not surprise you, has read the scheme of human faculty um, that, that, uh, that Frederick Myers published actually posthumously. He published his work in like, 1901 posthumously. Very influential on Young. M Myers never gets credit for the collective unconscious, but in many ways, his interpretation of the brain scheme absolutely anticipates this. So here is his diagram of consciousness. And he sees, you see that dark circle? That dark circle and the teeny, teeny space in that dark circle? That's your waking, everyday consciousness. That's the finite amount of brain matter you have that correlates to psychic energy. So you're, you have to think, this gets back to an idea that there isn't just thought. There's also the thinker. And sometimes in our small sort of um, supraliminal selves, this fractured portion that we identify as our rational selves, is located in the small part of the brain. But it's actually part of a much broader field that spills out over the brain that can actually then, in fainter and fainter field, merge with other people's minds, start to merge even with the world soul. And if the world soul experiences the totality of existence, past and present, in this one moment, can't you then prove if somebody's able to anticipate to predict future events, they must have access to a different realm where linear causality just doesn't apply. And they're accessing that not through their ordinary waking consciousness, they're, act they're accessing that through this transcendent experience only possible in altered states of consciousness. Actually, I'm not going to start with her. Um, well, it's any questions? We've got two minutes. Questions? No? Uh, attendance. attendance quiz? I'm just full. You know what? You want to have an attendance quiz? Because I didn't say. Does it? Where? On what sheet? When I, I, I add that, do you think that we don't want to tell you there's an attendance quiz beforehand? I'm adding that to every single. Yes, I'm fooling you now. I'm on to you. But should you want to have an attendance quiz? I'm, I'm for it. Yeah. No, we're getting a no. Negation, no. Ixnay. Yeah. Look, is that why you all came? Well, I guess it'll be one Thursday.